So, so Simon, we're going to go general, then we're going to go specific, then we're going to go general. Um, and I want to start with, you and I were both at COP. We had a really um, fantastic conversation at COP. Um, my view on COP, and I'd love your reaction to it, is it's an absolutely ingenious mechanism in multilateral diplomacy because it causes everybody in the world once a year to hand in their homework and then everybody else gets to grade it. Your peers get to grade it, your citizens get to grade it, global activists get to grade it, the media get to grade it. And then what COP is built in is a ratchet which causes the grade to go up every year. B was a passing grade, next year it's B plus, then it's A minus, then it's A, as we impose upon increasingly stringent standards upon ourselves. And in some ways, what emerges from COP is what emerges from COP, but the process of having to hand in your homework is what's interesting about COP. And tell us as somebody who's just written this book who went from being on the ground to McDavos in the middle of uh, Scotland, tell us a little bit how you experienced that process. Yeah, I think coming to that last point first about Davos in Scotland, I think I had that sense even before COP started because all sorts of people in, in business would be saying, you know, oh, see you in Glasgow. And it was, it was as though it was this year's Davos. Um, so that in itself, I think, look, that reflects the fact that climate change is now a big deal in business, and that's a good thing. Um, I think also there was a huge presence of business people in Glasgow to the extent that it did become perhaps a bit problematic logistically. Um, as you know, there were two-star single hotel rooms selling for over a thousand pounds a night um, because there was way too much um, demand relative to, to supply for hotel rooms. And who can afford to pay a thousand pounds a night for a hotel room while well, it's just big business people? And meanwhile, delegates, you know, some national delegates were having to commute in from other cities. So I think some lessons maybe were learned in terms of how to manage the, the logistics there. There was also, to be honest, I think there was a certain, from some of the people in Glasgow, perhaps a certain lack of seriousness about the issues. Um, I think, you know, one colleague of mine said that he was aware of bankers going out there to do M&A deals that were completely unrelated to climate change, but just because all the CEOs were there. <laughs> you know, so there was an element of that. Um, but in terms of what came out of the COP, I think by the standards of COPs, it was not bad, actually, because there have been some COPs that have produced basically nothing. This wasn't one of those. You did have some progress forward for the first time. Amazingly, on the 26th go, they finally got around to, naming, to mentioning fossil fuels explicitly in the, in the text, which was amazing when you think about it. And, and it's quite a sad thing that that's actually legitimately claimed as a triumph. Um, that tells you a lot. Um, in terms of agreements that were made during COP, um, there was a big agreement made to pursue a target on deforestation and also on methane. But for example, deforestation, one of the signatories to this pact to reduce deforestation was Brazil. And I was in Brazil for my book research. You'll see, by the way, some photos. These are photos that I took um, during my travels. Um, so you'll see some photos from Brazil um, among them. Um, you know, I, I just saw massive devastation ongoing in the Amazon. And the scariest thing was that the people that I met who were, I met some of the people who were actually burning down the rainforest, and they were perfectly happy for me to take their photo, use their names, because there's a sense of total impunity. So you have that on the ground, and then at COP, you have the Brazilian delegation saying, yeah, we're going to tackle deforestation, while President Bolsonaro is slashing the budget for enforcement of anti-deforestation action. So, huge disconnect between what happens on the ground and what happens at COP. I had a couple of really interesting conversations, um, I had many interesting conversations with people about the COP process, but two in particular. One with Mohammed Nasheed, who was the former president of the Maldives. He's mentioned in the book, because I interviewed him also during the book research. And he's been one of the most high profile global leaders in the climate struggle. And he said, look, you have to be quite realistic about what you can expect of a, of a process which relies upon unanimous agreement between nearly 200 countries in two weeks. So you're never going to get really ambitious, game-changing agreements out of a process like that. 
So uh, I think he's surely right in that to some extent. At the same time, I met a young climate activist called Bruno Rodriguez from Argentina, and he said, look, the COP is deeply flawed, but don't take it away from us because as people you know, from developing countries and also from, you know, especially from countries that are much uh, less well off than Argentina also, that's the best chance they have for really making themselves heard. So you point to the fact that in fact, there's not one COP, there are two COPs. The first COP is the multilateral interstate COP, which is driven by design as a lowest common denominator affair. Any given state can say, I don't accept that, and you have to try and produce global consensus. And therefore, it is always going to be underwhelming and disappointing, notwithstanding some of the really interesting advances. But the second COP is the high ambition COP, which allows coalitions of the willing, as it were, to assemble to make progress on areas of mutual concern, forests and methane being two of them. So let's stay with forests for a while because your book deals with, with this in, in some detail. I think what's interesting about the forestry deal is that it will deal, it will do to deforest, products that emerge from deforestation, uh, it will do to that what products that have emerged from modern slavery have done as a precursor. In other words, you will begin as a regulatory matter, a financial matter, a fiduciary matter, have to be highly cognizant of what is in your supply chain insofar as it, apl it applies to deforested uh, items in the same way people are now increasingly being concerned about slavery. Not because people have a kind of Damascus conversion, but because there are, are heightened forms of scrutiny and indeed liability that accrue as a result of that. So Bolsonaro may not enforce in the way that we hope he will enforce, but different mechanisms established through this mechanism may cause there to be greater scrutiny in the long run than we could ever have anticipated. Yeah, and I think your focus on, on the law, which as a lawyer I would expect, but, yeah. <laughs> um, but I think that's absolutely right. I mean, that's something which it all depends on how these things get translated into laws and regulations, because I think that's actually what's going to drive change. Um, so coming out of a COP, you know, you're not going to get the specifics of these things agreed at a COP. Um, and I think ultimately that's what's going to drive change because for companies, they respond to incentives. And the fundamental incentives that they respond to are mainly shaped by the, the legal and regulatory framework within which they operate. So let's now talk about um, <clears throat> your trip to the Congo. Um, Anybody who's been looking, reading, you know, the New York Times, who's been, you know, looking at an event we did on Friday and been reading your book, will know that the kind of global geopolitical rush to get rare earth minerals um, is a new scramble for Africa. Um, and cobalt in particular is essential amongst other things you were on the ground and I'd like you to tell a little bit about what you witnessed there as these products are scrambled for because the way minerals that are essential to the green revolution are coming out of the earth is morally complicated uh, to say the least. Yeah, I think any big powerful industry needs scrutiny and I think you know, the electric car industry is now a big powerful industry It needs to be. We need a big powerful electric car industry to drive zero emissions transport. Um, but there are problems in the supply chain for electric cars and, it can, and these problems can be dealt with. So in Congo I saw a lot of this up close. Um, there's been a lot of focus on child labour in Congo in, in these mines and I saw and heard some stories about that. In Congo, the, the most famous story around cobalt mining in Congo uh, is about this place called Kasulo which is an area of a town called Kolwezi. And one day, a man in Kasula was digging a toilet, a pit toilet behind his house, and he struck a seam of cobalt. So he then started digging a pit inside his house um, because he didn't want anyone else to know about his treasure. Um, and he, he just sunk a shaft, the mine shaft, inside his house. And he would carry out the cobalt under cover of darkness. He'd take it off to a market on the edge of town where there were some Chinese traders who would buy the cobalt from him. But then everyone else found out. His neighbors found out, and they thought, well, we can make money here as well. So everyone in Kasulo started digging up 
on, you know, around them, even under their houses. And it turned into this sort of ant's nest of, uh, of cobalt mines, houses started collapsing. It was incredibly dangerous, of course. These mines would often just collapse. So when I got to Kasulo, part of the area had been requisitioned by the government and turned over to a Chinese mining company. But you still had a lot of informal mines. So I went down inside one of them. It was a 40-foot deep mine shaft. You just go down barefoot, like a sort of Victorian chimney sweep. Um, and then you get to the bottom and you start crawling on your belly through these chambers. And, and you know that it can just collapse any time. There, there's no, this is not a sort of modern industrial mine. Um, and I was only down there for about 15 minutes, but that was pretty scary. And these guys are down there all day, every day. Um, and there have been children going down there as well. So I think people rightly focus on the child labor problem, because um, it's completely unacceptable that children should be doing any kind of labor, let alone dangerous, illegal labor. Um, but you've also got to think about the reasons why children are going down there in the first place. Why are they not in school? Why are their families so desperately poor that they allow them to do this? Well, this is a much wider problem, of course, and it's to do with massive scale corruption, which is to do with a mining industry that is dominated by foreign companies. Um, so these days, it's, it's mainly Chinese companies in Congo, but also there's a big role in the Congolese mining industry for, for Glencore, which is a European company. So it's no good just talking about corrupt African leaders. We also have to think about the foreign, Asian, European, North American companies that are collaborating and cooperating with those leaders at the expense of the ordinary people of these countries. So how do you think about, I mean, <clears throat> Glencore companies which have jurisdictional ties to Europe, the US, are going to be facing some risks once this becomes revealed. China is more complicated because, you know, Tianjin and, and, and the Uyghurs and Xinjiang and the way that, you know, a large number of the, of the kind of solar panels in the world are produced uh, in circumstances of slave labor, arguably, um, is not dissimilar to the more exported problem that you see in the Congo. And trying to get both transparency and accountability with China is a more complex problem. So did that surface in the course of your writing? I mean, do you, you obviously, from moral money, think about this a lot. How do you bring greater transparency to a country which so far has resisted that? Yeah, it's hard. And it's hard for anybody who's involved in the solar industry because realistically, you're probably going to have China in your supply chain. And I think you mentioned the situation in, in Xinjiang. I think it's pretty clear that some very, very ugly things are happening um, in industry in Xinjiang involving forced labor um, and solar companies. There's been some great reporting from Bloomberg, for example, which has shed light on that. So it's not clear to me what, what the answers are. Um, I think ideally companies should be trying to find verifiably slave labor free products. It, it's difficult in the solar market because China is such a huge part of it. But that's an incentive for companies in other countries actually to start ramping up their production because there is a demand for, frankly, there is a demand for solar panels that don't come from China at the moment because of these issues. And so once those market forces start being felt, which hopefully they will, and that obviously puts pressure on China to improve the situation. But anything to do with, with business in China, especially under the increasingly difficult political environment in China, is, is really, really hard for foreign companies. There's a section in your book which deals with rising oceans. Um, there's been this very, very interesting raft of litigation that has emerged. Um, in relation to the rights of island people, and particularly nations that are at risk of um, uh, you know, rising oceans, um, both before the International Court of Justice and the Human Rights Committee, there are completely radical cases emerging, which I think are going to go the way of the islanders, actually, which say, one, your right to life is being jeopardized by rising oceans. Your right to culture is being jeopardized by rising uh, oceans. And if Vanuatu gets its way, you may have the International Court of Justice saying there is a collective 
interstate interest in reducing greenhouse gases because certain member states of the United Nations are existentially at risk. And as you and I were saying earlier, some of this is already baked in. So tell us a little bit about your travels and your reporting to deal with, I think, one of the kind of thorniest of all questions is nations that are likely no longer to exist regardless of what we do in relation to uh, net zero or emission reduction. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's surreal, actually. I mean, there, there are four countries in the world, specifically, which are atoll nations. So that means they were formed by, by coral sand, which was sort of washed up in clumps. So that's the Maldives, Marshall Islands, Kiribati, and Vanuatu. And all of these countries will cease to exist in their current form, as far as I'm aware. I mean, that's what the science tells us. Um, so when I say in their current form, there may be bits of land that still remain above water, um, but a hell of a lot less than there is today. So in terms of the current shape of these countries, I mean, they, they will um, not be there in their current form. So it's surreal when you go to this. So I went to the Maldives, for example, and there's about a thousand islands in the Maldives, and for now, life goes on pretty much as normal. There has been some land lost. Um, they have built a, a whole new um, island, an, artificially, an artificial island, reclaimed land, that's called Hulamani. And this is about two meters above sea level, um, the whole thing. So because the rest of the country is more like one meter. Um, but it still looks pretty bleak. And so it's quite surreal when you go to a country um, that within 100 years, or potentially less, will be gone. Um, but there's not much that the people of the Maldives can actually do about this. You know, they, can, they can sort of build certain uh, you know, artificial reinforcement, they can try and you know, raise the land through land reclamation, but ultimately it's tough. And so Mohammed Nasheed, who I mentioned, I mean, he's been at the forefront of the climate debate um, because he's in such a powerful position, um, when he was president, certainly, you know, as the, the president of a country that will cease to exist. And he, and he talked about this using such language, saying, you know, we, we refuse to just quietly die. He was then, I mean, he, he, he's had a crazy life. I mean, he was a, he was a freedom fighter. He was, he was tortured and imprisoned, and he then he became president. Then he was deposed in a coup. He came back. He was blown up in a suicide attack earlier this year and was in a critical condition and still made it to COP26. <laughs> so, so, I mean, this is, and he's made an amazing recovery. Um, and when you think about what this man has been through, and he's still working so hard, and it's, it's disappointing, and, and his country faces annihilation. And I think it must be incredibly painful for him to see the lack of seriousness with, with which some other politicians from other countries are taking the whole thing. It strikes me that this, this particular set of, of um, dilemmas is a very devilish and thorny one because these nations don't have any real geopolitical power they have moral suasion, but they have little else. They have activism. They have parts of the law that may, you know, be in their favor. But the Torres Strait Islanders uh, are bringing a major case. One of the reasons they're bringing it is because they bury their ancestors close to the shore. And in a more poignant metaphor than you could possibly imagine, as the oceans rise, literally their ancestors bones are being reinterned onto the beach. Um, and they're arguing that Australia, which has jurisdiction, which is one of the worst polluters in the world, and this current government, one of the most recalcitrant, needs to do something about it. To which Australia says, it's a global problem, and B, we're not going to do anything about it. And so it's sort of this collective attribution problem that is really, really difficult to resolve, other than in the most general sense of, we need to halve our emissions by 2030 and be net zero by 2050. But there aren't specific things you can do about these islands. No, for sure. And I think this issue of legal liability, it's, it's tricky. Because if you realistically say these are really not powerful countries at all. They're small. They have small populations. They have small economies. Um, so they're not going to be able to force these things through. The only thing that can really drive that sort of action, I think, from the big countries is if the people of those big countries want it to happen. Um, I think there's a couple of problems. I think one problem is that there is simply a lack of understanding 
of the extent to which this is a problem that's driven overwhelmingly by rich countries, and in particular the richest people in the, in the rich countries. But, you know, people talk about China. So China today is, of course, the biggest emitter on an ongoing flow basis. But if you look at the total accumulated carbon emissions over history, and especially on a per capita basis, China is way smaller than Europe or, or the US. Um, so we do bear responsibility there. But the other thing, I had a conversation with a security guard at COP26 who was saying, the thing is, it's, it's nice to help the people in these other countries, but the government is not taking up, looking after people in this country, lower income people in this country. And the thing is, that that's true, actually. I think that's a, it's a reasonable complaint. If you look at the economic trends over the last 30 years, the top 10% and especially the top 1% in this country and in the US have been doing very well. The bottom 50% their incomes have been stagnating. And as long as that's the case, because we, we live in democracies, you're going to have a lot of pushback against very generous aid for people overseas. So I think if we don't tackle the problems of massive inequality in this country or you know, domestically for rich countries, it's going to be very hard to mobilize that kind of political support for international assistance. I read an absolutely chilling article in the last couple of days about uh, a kind of new form of eco-fascism or green nationalism emerging in the world where, you know, traditionally uh, the politics of sustainability have been embraced on the left. But there's a version of this which emerges from the right which says um, uh, refugees coming into our country are, have a carbon, are filthy, polluting, and have a carbon, uh, uh, you know, footprint, um, and it, the the kind of rising tide of kind of um, climate refugees are, you know, a great fuel of a kind of particularly kind of xenophobic right politics. So the idea that we're going to have the wind in our sails for a particular kind of progressive politics that embraces the just transition and marries both economic justice with moves towards sustainability with the green uh, pot at the end of the rainbow is a version, but it's by no means preordained, right? There's another version where this gets captured. Green politics becomes the politics of everybody and it reinforces our existing political tendencies and prejudices. And the right is very sophisticated in adopting it. So did you see some of that? I mean, Bolsonaro is a, a wonderful example, but in other places in your travels? You know, that one is not so much on my travels. For that one, I actually think more about Europe and the impact of the Syrian civil war um, in Europe. I, I think that that is a very worrying precursor of what could come in the future. So, as you know, the Syrian civil war followed the worst drought in that country's history. Um, there's a debate among scientists, I think, over how explicitly we can link that with climate change. But what we do know is that the, the effects of climate change are going to radically and over the long term increase dangers of drought and other severe weather events in the Middle East, in Africa and Asia. Um, and a lot of people are going to be on the move, mostly within their own countries, but also many of them internationally. And as you say, that is brilliant news if you are a fascist or hard right politician. That's great, it's exactly what you want to be able to drive support for your hateful breed of politics. Because then you can start calling for we need stronger borders, we need to keep out these foreigners, um, vote for me, and I'll deliver that. And you've already started to see that happening to some extent. Um, in Europe, from Hungary to France. I mean, we all remember the Breaking Point poster in this country during the, the Brexit campaign. So it's already started to feed into hard right politics. And I think you can expect more of that in the future if we don't do something about it. So let's not whip ourselves into a state of deep despair. So let's turn to some of the more optimistic stories in your book. <laughs> um, there's a really fascinating chapter about um, uh, 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 synthetic meat and molecular biology and advances particularly in Israel but elsewhere in finding a um, synthetic substitute to the livestock problem which if we don't address uh, all of our climate problems will be, all our climate efforts will be for naught. So tell us that story. Yeah, so this is, so the issue of synthetic meat, cultured meat, um, this is something that I came across in Israel 
specifically. And in fact, there are two companies developing fake meat um, in the Berg. Um, so, so that's um, so one of them is in California, Impossible Foods. Um, the other one being um, Aleph Farms uh, in Israel. Um, so Impossible Foods is plant-based, and Aleph, Aleph is uh, cultured meat, so it's using bioreactors and stem cells. And it'll be very interesting to see the, the race, as it turns out, between them. Um, but the, the cultured meat side, the, using the stem cells, it's going to be interesting to see how consumers respond to it. Because a lot of people think it's quite freaky, the idea of just growing meat in a tank. Um, but when you think about it, it could actually be dramatically better, so healthier potentially. You don't have all the antibiotics that get pumped into cows. Um, you don't have the amount of animal suffering, of course. Um, and the carbon footprint, of course, is, is much lower. So I think there's great potential there. Um, but there's a big question as to whether or not people are going to be, be comfortable with it. Where do you, I don't know if there's an FT position on this, but where do you come down on the question of genetic modification, genetic engineering? Because it seems one of the things that has happened from uh, the advances in AlphaGo and DeepMind and the protein folding and some of the things that we've seen through the advances in COVID is we are now doing things at a molecular and a stem level and a genetic level that are light years ahead of our comprehension. And both in relation to meat but also in relation to plants, um, we probably aren't going to meet our core climate goals um, or oh, it will be harder to meet our core climate goals, let me not make too strong a statement, without some capacity to play around with some of the kind of basic uh, molecular foundations and biological foundations of nature. And in Europe, people have been quite rightly skeptical of this, but is that skepticism going to have to be modified and wane in the face of uh, you know, the existential threats of, um, of climate change? So this is a really hot topic, right? And there's a whole chapter in the book, um, it's set in India, where I met three very different people with perspectives on this. So I met a farmer called Tulsi Ram, who's, like many farmers in Maharashtra, he's been getting smashed by the impact of climate change, drought. Um, I met someone in his area um, who runs one of the big Indian biotech companies called Mahiko, and they've been developing GM technology to develop drought-resistant seeds, and other sorts of crops that could be very useful, potentially, to farmers like Tulsi Ram. And then I met in Delhi, Vandana Shiva, who is one of the leaders of the global anti-GM food movement. And she believes, and she's very prominent internationally, Prince Charles has a bust of her on his estate, you know, she's very big in the whole organic food movement. Um, and she thinks this is a huge problem, it's going to deepen the excessive control of big ag companies like Bayer over uh, farmers in India. So in terms of where I come down on that, and I, I deliberately didn't put my opinions into, into it too prominently in the book, because this is not about my opinions, um, but I, as far as I can see, there's nothing inherently dangerous about GM technology. We've been messing around with the genetics of plants for thousands of years, that you know, farmers have been breeding plants, cross-breeding them, developing new strains. Um, I'm not aware of any really credible scientific studies that suggest there's anything inherently dangerous about GM crops, um, and there are promising signs that they can be useful. But I do think Van der Shiva has a point that if it's combined with very aggressive enforcement of intellectual property law by these big ag companies, then it can put farmers, especially poorer farmers, in a bad position. So as far as I know, there's not a health concern, but from a sort of economic power concern, there can be an issue there, I think. So everybody who, who looks at our kind of, the, the, the new nomenclature about net zero, realizes that it's net zero for a reason. We're not going to get to zero emissions anytime soon. We're not even going to get to zero emissions by 2050. What we need to do is have radically reduce our emissions and then radically increase all available technologies 
natural and other that help draw down carbon out of the atmosphere and the emissions on the plus side need to be offset by the emission reductions on the other side. That's how we get to net zero. And therefore, a lot of people are going reduce and then let's invest like maniacs in the drawdown. And if you're a kind of techno utopian, you go, humans are going to do terrible things, let's just bank on the drawdowns. And that is all the moral hazards associated with it. You went to Iceland and saw a really interesting, yet to be scaled, but potentially promising example of a drawdown. Tell us about that. Yeah, so in Iceland, I met someone called Edda Aradotte, and she's the CEO of Carbfix, which actually this whole project, it's their partners, Climbworks, who I also spoke to, um, their founders, Jan and Christoph, amazing company. Climbworks has been getting all the attention, but actually Carbfix is a really important part of the story as well. Um, so it's a partnership. So what Climbworks does is they build these boxes that can suck the CO2 out of the air. But then that leaves the question, what do you do with the CO2? So what Carbfix has done is they take the carbon dioxide, they dissolve it in, into water, so it's a soda water basically, pump that underground into the Icelandic bedrock, and within two years, nearly all of it has turned to stone, to limestone. So this is potentially exciting, right? And they... They can do it on a large scale. Each of these boxes can, uh, can capture about 50 tons of carbon dioxide per year, which doesn't sound like much when you think that the total greenhouse gas emissions are 50 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. So you need a, a billion of them to cancel that out. But Christoph, the CEO of Climeworks, said a really interesting thing to me. He said, well, do you realize we make nearly 100 million cars a year? And these boxes are actually easier to make than a car. So if we wanted to build a billion of them, we probably could, if we as the human race actually wanted to. So that helped to put it in perspective. But the reason why it's controversial um, is because there is this risk that people can think, well, let's just keep on burning fossil fuels because we'll just build all these boxes and they'll bail us out. And that's the reason why a lot of people in the environmental movement are very, very dubious about this sort of technology. So I get that, but I think we are going to have gross carbon emissions for quite some time to come. Even if we got rid of everything from industry and transport, you still have agricultural emissions. And the fact is, already, the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is way too high. So whatever happens, I think we need to look at ways of bringing it back down. And that was the most interesting technological solution that I've seen so far. So I want to kind of now just step back for a moment. You've been to you know, several dozen countries. You saw examples of kind of pillaging the worst of human avarice, deeply irresponsible behavior. You also saw these wonderful examples of hopeful innovations that could potentially contain the seeds of our salvation. Um, and I sort of warned you that I would ask you this, but uh, I want to kind of start by saying, when you sat down to write the book and you went from the particular to the general, what were the things that made you pessimistic and alarmed in relation to this threat that we're facing? What gave you a deep sense that we're not going to make it. Uh, spoiler alert, I am going to ask you the, the opposite question <laughs> afterwards, so don't get freaked out by the first questions. But what should we be really worried about? The problem for me, I think, is you know, I've met all sorts of really interesting people. When it came to the business and economy side of, of the book, I met people who are involved in green energy, I met people who are involved in the fossil fuel industry in places like Saudi Arabia and Australia. Um, and one thing that struck me very hard is currently we don't have the economic incentives in place for the change to happen at a necessary scale. You can still make a hell of a lot of money by burning oil and gas. You can still make a hell of a lot of money by burning coal. Um, you know, even in this country there was a listing recently of a coal company that was massively oversubscribed on the London Stock Exchange because investors in London are thinking, you can still make a lot of money from coal. And the reason for that is that the economic cost of burning fossil fuels is not paid currently by the people who are doing the burning of the fossil fuels. It's being paid by people predominantly 
in developing countries who are suffering the really serious impacts of climate change. So we have to fix that. We have to basically just make it much more expensive to burn fossil fuels. So we have the beginnings of an effective carbon pricing system in Europe. We don't even have anything close to it in the US. And, and even in Europe, it doesn't cover most of the emissions. So the, the big thing for me is that, so the, and the reason why I'm currently really worried about this is because we need to change the system to put a serious price on carbon across the economy. I think most economists that I've spoken to think that. And we're not really moving towards it. We have a lot of focus on you know, consumers reducing their personal carbon footprint, which, which is fine, but I think that can only really help at the margins. You know, we're currently heading for a brick wall at 100 miles an hour, and if we just keep the same system and just fly less and eat less meat, then we'll just be heading for that brick wall at 90 miles an hour instead of 100. But we still hit it very hard. Um, so that focus on systemic change, I, I became very strongly convinced of the need for it, but I didn't see really serious movement towards it, and I still don't after COP26. Open parentheses. Your point about putting a price on carbon London has the most extraordinary real life right in front of our eyes example on this which is the ultra low emission zones. Ultra low emission zones you go see what it is doing to the electric vehicle market and air quality in London. It's remarkable. It's imperfect mm. but it is changing both the way transport happens and air quality and it's just by sending a small pricing signal around air pollution which is another way of putting a price on carbon. Um, so I entirely agree with you. Very simple market signals with ratchets are the least we can do. And the fact that we're not doing that is all about capture by small groups of special interests which capture our politics in a time where the clock is ticking. So the other side of it is we saw it at COP, but maybe you saw it on your travels, but extraordinarily brave interesting, energetic, enthusiastic forms of activism which are beginning to potentially reshape our politics and reshape our sense of morality and public policy. Is that something that you, A, gives you hope and B, you have examples of through your travels? Yeah, so as you mentioned at COP, basically people my age and above tended to be relatively short on ambition when it comes to the level of change that's needed. People in their 20s and younger tended to be far more ambitious, far more focused on what needs to be done and not on the reasons why it should be done but can't. So in an ideal world it could be done but no we don't. All this sort of stuff. They were thinking look this is what should be done and we need to figure out how to do it. And that, that was incredibly refreshing. So on my travels I met um, a couple of people who were really interesting in this light. So in the Philippines, I met a young activist called Joanna Sustento, whose story is very powerful. Um, she lost all but one of her close relatives to Typhoon Haiyan in 2013. And she has since been campaigning for climate justice, which she defines as, it comes back to that point I made about the economic costs of fossil fuel pollution being paid by her family, her parents, her three-year-old nephew who are all swept away by the typhoon, um, while fossil fuel companies continue to earn enormous amounts of money. So the com we met when she was protesting outside the headquarters of Shell in the Philippines, and she was protesting outside the headquarters of Shell because Shell was the most, certainly you know, the year before we met, Shell had paid out $20 billion in dividends to its shareholders. That's more than any company in the world. The chief executive of Shell earned $62,000 per day. And this was possible only because those costs were not being borne by Shell, they were being borne by the people of Takloban, where, where Joanna is from, and many, many other vulnerable communities around the world. And I think you know, the message from her was, was very inspiring, and that she was not there at COP, but many, many other young activists from around the world were there, and there was the younger generation was felt. Um, Juan Carlos Monterrey, who's here um, from Panama, Juan Carlos, age 29, was the chief negotiator for Panama at COP26. 
Um, so this, this new generation is also coming through into the, into the political world um, and making their presence felt. I mean, Juan Carlos gave an amazing closing address to, to the conference um, in which he gave a call to action to youth around the world to get involved, in, to get involved politically not only thinking about what you can do as a consumer, but thinking about what you can do as a citizen, which I think is a really important message. I will say the, the being <coughs> reassured by and also calling upon youth to be um, activists around climate always makes me feel like it's like calling on people of color to fight against racism or LGBTQ people to fight against homophobia. The, the people most at risk of a particular form of discrimination or oppression or injustice get called upon to be at the forefront of it, whereas the people who have contributed to it sort of either sit by passively or are kind of reassured by it. And, and I, I think one of the important things for all of us to do when, when we confront that form of activism is to spur ourselves into even greater forms of activism and frankly higher degrees of moral shame that you know it's the people most who bear the greatest brunt of it who are having to be most active. And I, you know, I think one of the things we're trying to do here at The Conduit is to make it all of our responsibility um, uh, because it is. Um, so I want to, you met in Greenland a really interesting scientist and um, I want us to show a clip about uh, a conversation you had and then for you to um, expound a little more on that. I started about 1990 to start climate observations on the Greenland ice sheet. And then starting in 2005, we realized that we have more and more warming at that elevation we made our measurements, which was 1,100 meters above sea level. It's a permanent camp called Swiss Camp. And there we understood that Greenland is no longer in balance. And that means we actually lose more ice in Greenland than we can accumulate by snowfall during the winter time. We can see quite clearly that the temperature has increased on an annual mean by one degree over 10 years. One degree warmer over 10 years is a big climate signal. If you take the entire ice that is from the last ice age, we have actually stored in Greenland ice. If we melt it today, it would increase sea level globally by six meters. Greenland is the big unknown for the next decade, next century, how quickly is sea level increasing globally. And that is why we do all these studies in Greenland. Yeah, so that was um, Conrad Stefan. I don't know if everyone could read the titles at the end. So he died four days after we, we shot that video. Um, and he had actually been telling me, so he, he, he was one of the great scientists, you know, in the whole climate space, actually, and especially when it came to studying the polar ice. Um, he had spent 30 years studying the Greenland ice sheets, and he'd gone there every single year since 1990. And he had a camp on the ice sheet. It was called Swiss Camp because he was Swiss, and, <laughs> and um, it was uh, built on a wooden platform, um, and they, they, they worked really hard, they had, they had a great time while doing it, they would have a three-course dinner every night, they had a sauna with a propane-fired <laughs> sauna, um, but he was, he, was, um, he was a mentor to um, you know, generations of young scientists over 30 years. And he had shed so much light on what is happening um, to the ice sheet in Greenland, and therefore we can extrapolate from that um, things about what's happening in Antarctica also. Before he started his work, it was thought that the ice sheets, um, the ice sheets in, in, in Greenland and Antarctica would respond to temperature changes over the course of centuries or millennia he realized that 
and you know, his findings showed that actually it's changing far more rapidly than that over decades or even years. Um, and he told me before he, we, we met in a village called Alulacet in, in Greenland, and the next day he was uh, traveling, he was going to get a helicopter to his camp, and he was telling me it's getting very dangerous up there. Um, he was saying that, um, you know, the, these crevasses are opening up on, on the ice sheet. He was saying it's no longer safe to, to walk around. Um, and he was very disappointed by um, the, the lack of action from politicians, even with all the incredible weight of evidence. We're quite lucky when you think about it to have this incredible weight of modern science to show us how much danger we're putting ourselves in. Um, but he was, he was very disappointed by the lack of action that was, was coming from the politicians. Um, and he knew that he was putting himself at risk. He, you know, he told me about the extent of the danger that was up there. And in a way, it's, it's obviously a sad story. I think he would want us to tell his story. He was always trying to get the word out. He would bring along, he would bring filmmakers, he would bring artists, he would bring journalists to, to Swiss Camp. He wanted to try and communicate that message. Um, and I think one thing that was really inspiring for me, um, I think he would have actually been really excited if he had been at COP26 and he'd been meeting people like Juan Carlos, he'd been meeting some of the amazing young activists I met there, he would see that actually there are people who are treating it with the urgency that it deserves. It, it, may, it seems to be mainly young people, which is why I'm quite looking forward to seeing them getting into positions of high political office. <laughs> but, um, but I think it's, it doesn't have to be a sad end to his story in the sense that his, the impact of his work is still being felt. He's, you know, he can still continues, his work continues to be very highly cited, very highly influential. There are all these scientists all over the world who he trained and mentored who are now doing work of their own. And I think if we can start really acting um, on that incredible body of scientific evidence, um, if we can start following the example of some of these amazing young people, um, who I, some of whom I met at COP26, who are really treating it with the urgency it deserves, um, then, we will, then we will start to be getting somewhere and, and really delivering the kind of action that he wanted to see. Simon, thank you very, very much uh, for that. Um, I'm now going to turn over to the audience and uh, give you an opportunity to ask um, Simon questions. We, we kind of debated whether we would end on this note because it's sort of poignant and slightly depressing and sad, but I think we wanted to do that in the sense that it served as a kind of spur to action uh, and uh, left us all with the sense that there is work to be done which there indubitably is. So, over to you. Um, so I spend my life um, reading the FT because I'm a financial journalist and I write a lot about sustainable investing and talking about big institutions, big pension schemes, building that into the way they manage their portfolios. Um, a question I have is really about sort of fossil fuels and at the moment there is a sort of... Um, we talk about a lot of green en energy companies coming up, but there's a very much a sort of a thought that what's going to happen is that fossil fuel companies are going to use their short-term cash flow to build the transition into green energy, which could work, or what could happen is what ha always happens in the tech sector, tech sector where you get creative ways of destruction. You had IBM, then you had Microsoft, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I wondered if you had... Any thoughts on how you think that's going to evolve, if they're going to be able to reinvent themselves, setting aside all the, all the kind of questions about fossil fuels, because that's such a big can of worms, but just from how you see that evolving? Yeah, I mean, my big concern about this is something I mentioned earlier is the incentives that, that are pushing these, these companies in the right direction or not, because currently... BP and Shell, they do still make the overwhelming bulk of their money from oil and gas. Um, and that will remain the case as long as we have the current set of rules. So I think 
you're seeing various things, um, various approaches being tried to push change within the existing system. So for example, divesting from fossil fuel companies, which makes your own portfolio look really good, but then those shares are still owned by someone. And then if, if the companies themselves, they start divesting from fossil fuel assets, you will often see those going into private companies, which are less transparent and are often less responsible in their stewardship of them. Um, so I keep coming back to this point that I, I really think we have to change the, the economic incentives that will force these companies. I think, you know, for example, Bernard Looney of BP, you know, I think he wants to push that company greener as fast as he can while still making a huge amount of money for shareholders. I mean, that's, that's his job. I mean, that, that is literally his, his job description. So as long as the way to make a huge amount of money for his shareholders is to, um, is to, is to keep producing oil and gas, that's, that's going to happen. So I think we risk putting these executives in this weird position where we say, okay, you have a fiduciary duty to make a huge amount of money for your shareholders, but also just do it in a really nice way, and you know, you know, we're just gonna leave that pretty, but it, it, it's sort of an impossible ask in a way, and I wouldn't wanna be the head of a fossil fuel company because you know, if you go, if you, if you really try and drive change, you will definitely get fired under the current framework. Um, you know, there's someone I was speaking to at COP26, Emmanuel Fabet, who was the CEO of Danone, and he was trying to push that company, you know, really, really hard in a sustainable direction. And he, he's no longer the CEO of Danone, right? I mean, because if you really, really try and push ambitious change, um, while, and, and then shareholders think you're giving up the returns, then you put yourself in an untenable position. So I think the the companies that you mentioned will really start changing their practices when the, the laws and regulations around them change. Thank you for sharing your experiences with us. Um, my question is about travel, in that there's been a lot of focus on getting people to travel less and you know burn less fossil fuels doing so. But my question around that is, um, to be completely transparent, I own an ecotourism company, so like I do have a st I do have a, a dog in this race. But um, one of the questions I have is that, I mean, one of the reasons why I'm in that business is I find that when people travel, they make connections with other people, and then they care more about what happens in some of the lesser visited parts of the world. And if we're going to ask people in the UK, in the US, and other developed countries to make sacrifices if they don't know the people who they're making those sacrifices for, will they be willing to do it? And if we travel less, will we become less connected and people become even more nationalistic? And you were talking about sort of right-wing eco-nationalism becoming a problem. And if we become more isolated from each other, do you think that'll become an even worse problem? Yeah, it's a really important point. I mean, the emphasis on traveling less, I mean, that's something that, the, as soon as I had it there for this book, I thought, everyone's going to ask me about my personal carbon footprint, right? <laughs> so, so, so I'm glad you raised the issue because it gives me a chance to address it. I mean, the, the FT published a piece that I wrote sort of around the journey for my book, and I, I actually gave them 200 photos. That we, oh, we've lost the photos. Maybe we can put it back on. Um, so do, do you want to put it back on just so we have something, so we lose the blue screen? Um, so I just sent them a whole bunch of photos of the, um, that you've been seeing in the slideshow. Um, and then and, and they used the one of me on a motorbike in Mongolia, which, so there were a whole bunch of people who saw the article, they went straight to the comment section and started criticizing me for, they said fair enough in a way, I did look at it. <laughs> but, um, but no, I think more seriously, I personally don't focus on, you know, trying to tell people not to travel, because I think it's a bit of a distraction, because I really think we have to think about systemic change. And if we just keep the same system and all fly less, it doesn't really, um, achieve the amount of change that we need to see. Um, but yeah, I mean, I do think, I hope we will see it become more expensive to, to fly because that will be, if we have a serious carbon pricing system, then it will. I mean, that has, that has to be the consequence. Um, so, you know, I like traveling and, you know, so I, I would end up probably traveling less. Um, so, and by the way, I don't expect that to happen anytime soon. I hope it does happen. And that does have implications 
I hope that people will still travel at least to some extent. And, and, and by the way, you know, in the long term, I think there will be at some point, I, I do think we're going to get to some sort of sustainable aviation solution. It may not be for a very long time, and we'll have to see. In the meantime, if there is less travel, then there is the danger of what you just described. But I think there is also a huge amount of potential for people to pay more attention to people in other parts of the world. You know, thanks to all the miracles of modern technology, you can have a, a Zoom call with someone anywhere in the world. You can access all sorts of images and, and videos and things that just make these places and people seem less distant. So, so I think even if there is less travel, I do think there is still a lot of hope for us to find smart ways of connecting with people and empathizing with people in other parts of the world. God forbid the only form of empathy you get is from the metaverse. Um, <laughs> so another question, please over there, yeah. Hi there. Really great talk and love them with the pictures as well. Um, what do you think can be done to uh, address, I guess, what could be a, a green backlash coming up? Um, and I, you know, thinking about some organisations who are employing, I guess, uh, sort of, you know, interesting, I guess, comms and media strategies, you know, taken from recent sort of more uh, sort of political movements to effectively swing public opinion. And what role do you think, I guess, government has, uh, if any, in that? You're thinking in particular backlash, backlash against greenwashing, as it's called. Uh, well, no, green activists. Green action. Well, green action, right. Yeah, so when it comes to green action, I think it goes back to the point that I was um, referring to earlier that a security guard at COP made where he was saying you know, this, this can be something which is pursued by, by an elite and paid for by the working classes. And you saw obviously in France with the Gilets jaunes protest, there was a sense that here you've got this this increased tax on fuel, um, which is a sort of hobby horse project of, of the elites and it's paid for by the poor because proportionally, of course, if you're on a lower income, your energy costs um, of all sorts are going to be a higher share of your, your outgoings. Um, so I think there is a real risk of that. I think, interestingly, especially in this country, I think there's a lot of talk about this. You see, you see a different green debate in different countries. I think the concern about working class people bearing the cost is particularly acute in this country. So I think one possible way that we could go is if, if we apply carbon pricing, you make sure, and this is actually an argument that's being put forward by sort of old guard members of the Republican Party in the US. Um, so certain people would probably look at that with a certain amount of suspicion, but this is, this is very much the pre-Trump Republican Party. Anyway, the idea being that you put a tax on carbon and you make it revenue neutral. So you pay out the proceeds to every household in the country. I think ideally you'd made this progressive, so lower income households get more. Maybe politically that would be difficult because as you know, there's a whole you know, movement on, in the right wing media in this country and in the US criticizing you know, handouts to the undeserving poor and all this sort of quite nasty <coughs> talk. So it could be more difficult if it's made progressive. But I do think it's worth looking at the idea of paying out the proceeds to households um, because people would notice those checks. There'd be several thousand dollars per household coming into their, into their accounts. And there would no longer be this feeling of you know, the government just using the opportunity to take more money from working people because if that money was transparently coming right back into everyone's bank accounts, that sort of thing is, is important. But the other part of it is, I think, tax policy. So Al Gore has been talking a lot about the need to see climate action, climate change, in the context of other issues. And one that he talks about a lot is hyper-inequality, as he calls it. And I think that's absolutely right. So this, this problem of the, the widening gulf between the very rich and the rest, um, as long as that's the case, as long as people still have this sense of massive inequity uh, within, within their countries, it's going to be very difficult. So I think at the same time as looking at climate action, we have to look at issues of economic justice domestically. And that's why I'm uncomfortable with the extent to which the conversation seems to be being driven to a large extent by the very richest people 
um, in, in the UK and the US in particular. Um, because if you're one of the big beneficiaries of the current economic system, you don't necessarily have an incentive to look at going back to historically normal rates of income tax on the rich, for example. So it's tough, but I think it's possible. <clears throat> As somebody who grew up in the anti-apartheid movement, I'm going to take a two-minute crack at that because it's something I feel very passionately about. I think our green politics right now, firstly, I'm a great exponent and fan of activism that is occurring across the board. I don't want to speak ill of an incredibly important movement, but I think our movement needs to get better and more sophisticated. And it needs to get better and more sophisticated because I think kind of targeting of urban centers and shutting it down and t sticking yourself to roads and where you have a, a sense of uh, the general broad public bear the collective brunt of what you're doing risks alienating the movements and it's also very easy to target in a way that um, all the new anti-protest laws that are coming out are terrible and draconian. There are people who are going to jail for six to 12 months at a time. And it's, and it's given a way to sort of shut down the space for public protest. But it's also picking the wrong targets. You should be picking Exxon and BP and bottom trawling fishing companies and slave labor using cobalt companies. And they're a really good set of villains to target through mass action that we're not targeting. Um, and I also think we need to use different language, right? So we had a dinner the other night here at The Conduit, and one of the leaders of the campaign to legalize same-sex marriage in both Ireland and Australia, places where they won. Now bear in mind, 10% of your population in both of those countries are the beneficiaries of something that you won 60% of the vote on in plebiscites to, to legalize same-sex marriage. We still, in the climate justice movement, and I entirely agree that we need to marry economic justice with uh, the net zero quest, we don't get more than 15% of the popular vote in our politics. And the German Green Party got 15% of the, of the vote in a context where Germany had the worst floods in 500 years. We are responsible for political malpractice, that we are unable to win and contest politics. If you have inequality and climate, the two big issues of our time, and you can't marry those together in a winning 55, 60% political coalition, you have a lack of imagination. And you need that in our politics, you also need that in our street, you need it in our boardrooms, you need it in our lawyers. There are a whole bunch of things we need to do, and we all need to get much smarter at this, much quicker. And one of the things we're going to do here at The Conduit over the next year is do a whole series of talks and dinners and programs about how we accelerate and cross-learn around these topics, because I think there's amazing global learning to be done. There's a ton of interesting case studies, and we've all got to get better at it. Please. I've actually seized the mic, um, but um, apologies. Uh, I was just asking um, about uh, this idea of um, bringing together the book and that spirit of cross-learning and acceleration. Um, often when you write a book, it's sometimes a bit of a smorgasbord of what goes in and what doesn't. Um, and there's some cutting to be done. So I'd really like to ask Simon what uh, chapter, um, if you'd have had time or space, um, even proposing maybe a sequel, would you have thrown in? Yeah, I mean, there was a lot that didn't go in, of course. Um, I mean, I spoke to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in the book, and it's something that I tried to do. Um, and by the way, I mean, I, there's a whole team that goes into a book, and it's just, I get to have my name on the cover. Um, but, you know, for example, Sophie Lambert, my agent, Joe Thompson, my editor, and, you know, various other friends who gave feedback on the, on the, um, on the ideas and the structure were a huge part of it. And one of the things that we tried to do was to just not have an enormous number of different people to the point that it got confusing. Um, but you know, every single conversation I had over the course of those two years was massively, massively useful. And there's, 
Ernest Hemingway used to talk about an iceberg. So he'd say the, the visible part of the iceberg is what's on the page. And then but that's only a tiny part of the iceberg. And below it, you've got this enormous um, you know, iceberg below the surface, which is invisible. But that is what means that the stuff of the, the visible parts is hopefully worth reading. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there were, no, there were no places that I visited that didn't make it into the book. Um, you know, because everywhere I went, and I wasn't sure if this was going to be the case, actually. Um, everywhere I went, I got way more than I bargained for, actually. Because, of course, you, you know, I, I knew I was going to the Amazon to look at deforestation. I didn't know exactly what I would find. I thought I'd have maybe one strong story, and I ended up having so much, you know, because I met indigenous people who were fighting to protect their homelands. I met three indigenous, I spent time with three different indigenous communities, and I only mentioned one in the book, for example. So that's, you know, so two other amazing uh, indigenous communities, the Karapuna and the Paitasurui. Um, I decided, you know what, this is about trying to reach the reader with maximum force, and it makes sense to focus on one single community. Um, so that, that's a good example of things that I left out, and it's, and it felt crazy on one level to leave out the Karapuna and the Paitasui because you know, their stories are amazing. Um, but you, this is one, one example of, as you said, there's so much left on the cutting room floor. Um, and yeah, hopefully a sequel someday. So we're going to, you've seized the other mic, so I'm going to give it to you because possession is nine tenths of the law. And then we are going to go up to the third floor. The FT has. Uh, or no, not the FT. Simon William Collins. William Collins has decided to um, buy drinks for everybody here, so you can go up and continue the conversation upstairs. But also, the first, the first drink, and then yes, the exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not anyone. <really. laughs> <laughs> buy a drink for everybody who's here, um, and then and then um, there's also book signings and continuing the conversation. So I'm going to let you ask that question. You'll do a, a, a crisp reply, and then we're going to go and. Um, continue the conversation on the third floor. Thank you, Paul. Um, just building on Julia's question around travel, your point around kind of using the carbon tax to filter back to those who are kind of below the line, let's say. Um, and also some points from the Bhutanese ministers who were here last week um, speaking about COP and their reaction to it. I just wondered if you could speak a bit about, like, in, uh, the ministers from Bhutan said it very succinctly, and I'll mince their words, but they said basically in, in their country, when they went around because there was a huge flood that ruined the rice crop, the um, Bhutanese ministers offered these people that were affected by the flood money um, because they were suffering. And the response from these farmers who, who had had no income for the year responded and said, no, actually COVID-19 has happened. Um, there are others here who need the money more than us. And it highlighted the, the difference between the me and the we. And oftentimes in Eastern countries, broad generalization, the, the we is more important than the me. Um, from my accent, you'll know that I'm from America, um, where we all travel by cars and all sorts. Um, and it's, for, I'm sorry to say, capitalism is often individualistic. So to me, the three points here kind of says to me that there needs to be a culture shift in the West from the me to the we. And I guess any thoughts on, from your travels or your experience at CUP to say, you know, where are we on that shift? And is it conceivable that we could bring more people to the we in the next 10 years? Yeah, I think you're right that the sense of we is, in some respects, you notice it, particularly in Asian countries. I mean, I, I, I spent four years in Korea, and famously during the late 90s economic crisis in East Asia, you know, many Koreans, especially Korean women, went and um, gave their gold to the government to pay off a national debt, which is, yeah, that, that's a pretty vivid example of that sense of solidarity. I think one thing, and I keep on coming back to the youth climate movement because it was really, I mean, there was so much from COP26 that was really quite dispiriting and 
and demoralising. Um, but whenever I met a member of the youth climate movement, I'm not saying they're right on everything, um, but just the sense of ambition they brought to it was exciting, and the sense of solidarity that I think they do have. So you'll have noticed that Greta Thunberg kept quite a low profile at COP26, so she, she, did, she did make herself heard at the beginning, and then for the rest of COP26, you heard a lot more from others, especially from the Global South, so people like Vanessa Nakate, people like Liz Watuti. Um, so I think actually the youth climate movement, they, they are a we, they're, they're a global we. Um, you know, I met a couple of them one day who were talking about how they, and, and, and to Paul's point about, you know, the metaverse, we don't want to go, we don't want to solve the, try and solve the climate crisis through the metaverse. But what they've been doing, they've been doing a lot of video conferencing just all the time, during the pandemic especially, and so they've been really embracing that. And um, one of these young activists said to me that, you know, we do so much through video conferencing all over the world, and when we see each other, it's just sort of to, you know, to add to what we've already been doing through this huge global conversation. So, so that's one of the things that, um, gives me hope for that. But, but yeah, I think more tough communication about these things is, is really important. Simon, thank you so much, both for your book, for the broader conversation, and for your eloquence tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you.